Welcome to the first lecture video for Physics 125, uh, College Physics 1, at Grand Rapids Community College. The way that we've designed this course is this set of lecture videos and example videos distills down to the very key information that we need in order to be able to complete our course learning objectives and figure out the problem solving skills that we'll be using all semester. Now we also have a textbook. It's absolutely free uh, and it can be accessed through a web version, through a PDF you can download and then have available, um, or you can buy or rent a printed copy if it's easier for you to read through um, a paper copy of the book. At the beginning of every lecture video, we will have links to the online version of the textbook so that as you're reviewing any material, if there's something you recognize that you want to get more information about or make sure to review a little bit deeper, um, the posted PDF slides on Blackboard have clickable links here. Each one of these blue and green links is clickable. The bolded green sections are the ones that we're spending more time and effort on in this chapter. All right. So, you are taking this physics class, maybe because you like physics, but probably because you need this particular course for a transfer requirement, a degree requirement, something has um, had you specifically take Physics 125. And the reason for that is because we build critical thinking and problem solving skills in this class in a way that you may not have had a chance to build in any other class you've taken so far in your college course or may be required to take in the future. The really important thing to recognize is, first of all, physics really is useful to understand because it describes the world around us. Physics is really everywhere. And the knowledge that we have about physics is based on ideas about how the world works and then testing those ideas through experiments and observation. Now, the goals of this course are really to build problem solving skills and critical thinking skills. You will be using those in any field of study that you go into, even if you're not thinking that you're gonna use physics directly um, in those courses. Now, when we think about the terms that we use to describe science, there's a couple that I want us to recognize that are in chapter one. Although our main goal for this chapter, which is gonna consist of two lecture videos and four longer example videos, is really to understand units and the importance of those. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's make sure we recognize that when we are describing ideas using more visualized, simple systems, we typically talk about those as models, a easier way to understand a much more complicated system kind of like the atom picture here on our slide. If instead we describe an idea with a simple mathematical statement or an equation of sorts, it might be called a law. We will be talking about Newton's laws of motion, for example, in chapter four. And when we have an idea of any kind that has enough scientific evidence to support it, we call that a theory. One of the most important things that any science educator can convey to their students is that the word theory really does have important scientific meaning that is different than the more haphazard way that we use it in everyday language. When we talk about the theory of gravity or the theory of evolution or the theory of climate change, we are talking about ideas that have all of this built up scientific evidence to support them and nothing has directly conflicted with that idea because then it would have gotten thrown out through this process that we describe as science. Now we come back to this idea of experiments that test these ideas. You will have a lab component of this course. You won't have me as the um, direct instructor, but we work together to make sure that the labs reinforce ideas from lecture and follow the same pacing that our curricula um, both do. And when you make measurements or write down values, either in a lab or when you're doing problem solving um, and are writing down a final answer, 
you should always be listing a number and a unit. And it's my goal in this very first lecture video to try to make sure we understand why those units are so important. So let's go through a couple of examples. My cat Penelope is eight and a half years old. Eight and a half is the number, and years is the unit that gives that number context. She weighs 15 pounds. Again, the number is 15 and the unit is pounds so that we know what that 15 is trying to tell us. And then yesterday, she chased two bugs. Two is the number, and bugs, while it's not a standard scientific unit, is still the thing giving that number context, and so it is a unit. When we remove units from these statements, some of them make sense, but some of them really don't. So for example, this first one, my cat Penelope is eight and a half. That actually doesn't sound unreasonable to our ears because that's how we tend to talk about ages in everyday conversation, right? My niece is 16, or my brother is 27, things like that. But if you knew that I had a full-grown cat and a new kitten at home, you might not know which one is Penelope, and that eight and a half could be months or it could be years. So there's still ambiguity when we take out the unit. She weighs 15, the next statement, no longer sounds right to us. That's not how we talk about mass or weight. And for 15, we really hope that I mean pounds because 15 kilograms would be an enormous cat. And then yesterday, she chased two. For any of you who have a cat or a dog at home, you know that that too really could be anything. Maybe Penelope is chasing two leaves outside the window, or maybe she's chasing two catnip mice. Without the unit there that tells us what that two is trying to indicate for us, we lose understanding of what we were trying to get out of that statement. Units are absolutely essential. One thing that I say all of the time in on-campus classes, and so you might not see it in these recorded videos nearly as often, is that one of the biggest things that makes a physics class specifically different than a math class is that we have real situations that we are thinking about, and we have context for all of the calculations that we do. There is a reason why are we, we are doing those calculations not just to understand how math works. And so those units are always going to help us give our work context. The reason why this number just got written down is because it's telling us something about the situation. All right, here's another way that we can try to think about why units are important to always include. There's a thought experiment here. So what I want you to do is I want you to imagine or draw um, in your notes, a cube. This cube has six sides that are squares, the definition of a cube, where each, where the edge of each square has a measurement of five. We don't know the unit. Now, I want you to imagine a familiar object next to, under, or on top of the cube. Again, maybe even draw it out in your notes. Pause the video for as long as you need to to try to ponder what this cube might be and come up with at least one object, maybe a couple that you could put next to or interacting with the cube that you came up with. Okay. So um, a friend of mine um, several years ago drew these uh, for me. Uh, several possible examples, maybe your exact thought wasn't here, but for example, a cat cube, that five Maybe, kind of subconsciously, we decided that that was five centimeters across, and it could be a small enough cube to be like cat toy sized. Maybe instead that cube was five inches across and it's a little bit bigger, and so now we have a gentleman in a top hat holding it. Maybe that cube is five yards on each side, and so people are bowing down to this strange and mysterious cube of great wonder. Or maybe we think even bigger, and we are thinking about a cube that is five megameters on each side, and it's a cube being hit towards the earth in a game of galactic billiards. All of these would be valid answers to the thought experiment because we didn't specify the unit. When you leave units off your answers, it doesn't actually tell me if you understand what specific answer we were looking for. 
So keep that in mind. And if there's only one single idea to get out of this entire lecture video, it's that there should always, always be units attached to numbers in our physics class. Okay. Now, in terms of what units we actually are going to be working with, there are three basic types of measurements that we're going to use in Physics 125. Length, like the sides of the cube that we just talked about. Mass, similar to my cat Penelope, although when we get to Chapter 4, we're going to be making sure we understand that there is a difference between mass units, grams and kilograms, and weight units, force um, units like pounds or newtons. And then time is our third basic type of measurement. We use that on a daily basis. And there are more types of units, but most of the standard basic types are ones that show up in Physics 126 instead. Units for um, current and charge and things like that. Now, we will also see more complicated things that are built off of these standard three, but these really are the three basic unit types that we need to become familiar with. So what I want you to do now is to brainstorm some units that you use in your everyday life. If this were an on-campus course, we would actually make a list together on the board and talk about the different um, types of units that come up. And what I would really like you to do is to pause the video, if possible, and make a small list to yourself in your notebook. Think about things that you use on a daily basis and the units attached to any numbers that you work with. So pause the video and make a little list. Okay. One thing to note before I move on, all throughout this semester, we are going to have these pause and think kind of questions. And it really is beneficial once we start to get into problems that have correct answers to take a moment and give yourself as much time as you need to to think through the question being asked so that you can see if you've arrived at the correct answer before it's presented to you. It's going to be a really simple little way to see if you're on track without anyone looking over your shoulder to tell you if you're, um, if you're wrong. No one's, no one's judging you for being incorrect with those questions that will inevitably have correct answers. Here, there was no right or wrong answer. I did ask the same question to my friends on social media, and in the hour and a half that I collected responses, this is what they got back to me with. So I made a little word, word cloud. The bigger the word, the more people that said it. And so if you look at it, there's a lot of things here um, that show up if we're talking about cooking or baking. That's a very common everyday kind of um, thing to do. And so cups and teaspoons and tablespoons, those show up if we're trying to measure things out for cooking. Those three that I mentioned, cups, teaspoons, tablespoons, those are all volume units. And they're based on, then, length units, only length times length times length. You can also see lots of time units here, minutes, hours, seconds. We use those all of the time, right? Any time that we're looking at our watch to decide how long have we been watching this video for, we're looking at those units. There's plenty of other um, more interesting ones that maybe one or two people said, right? Um, so, for example, calories, those show up all the time. We might not think of them as often, but that is a unit um, of energy. We'll be talking about that in Chapter 7. Uh, retweets, that's probably not going to show up in Physics 125, but just like with the bugs example with my cat Penelope, that is a unit that describes a number. If someone tells you about those things, that is giving that number context. Okay. So... In this particular class, we are using the standard international system of units. This is often also called the MKS system because it stands for meters, kilograms, and seconds. So although there are lots of different length units, and on the previous um, slide there was miles, there was inches, there was kilometers, meters is the standard unit that we will be using when we are putting numbers into equations after chapter one. Chapter one really doesn't have equations, um, but it will talk, we will talk about unit conversions as a problem type. Meters is the standard length unit. Kilograms is the standard mass unit. Although we could talk about grams, kilograms is the standard that our equations are built to use, and so we're going to have to make sure that we're used to putting things into kilograms. 
And then seconds. Although we think about minutes and hours just as often as seconds, our standard time unit is going to be seconds, and that's the one that we will need to be um, making sure that all of our time units are in. So we'll see um, how those work together moving forward, but it's worth noting that if you want more detailed descriptions or definitions of these, um, how they are defined, the textbook has more details on each of those. Okay, the other thing that we need to build up an understanding of in chapter one are metric prefixes. If we go back one slide, meters, kilograms, and seconds, even in our built-in standard set of units, there is already one of these metric prefixes, kilo, which means 1,000. So if we have one kilogram, that means we have 1,000 grams. One of the other most common uh, metric prefixes that is going to show up is when we are measuring things in lab, we might have a meter stick but be measuring things in centimeters, a fraction of a meter. You do not need to memorize these metric prefixes, but you do need to understand how they are used when they come up. So these six are more common than the others that are listed in the textbook, but the textbook does have a more complete list of all of the different metric prefixes that you might see in this semester and beyond. Each of these columns is describing the same piece of information in a slightly different labeling kind of way. So the met metric prefixes are kind of like the nickname, where the full value in words or numbers is the more complete way of talking about that thing without using the nickname. So if we have a kilogram, Kilo is that nickname that stands in for 1,000. So one kilogram is 1,000 grams. Value in numbers, if we're writing it out, we don't really use words when we're writing things out. We would write out 1,000. Scientific notation, we're going to start to use more and more when we get into very large numbers and very small numbers. The place where it is going to be used by far the most is in the later parts of chapter six, but we do need to at least recognize that that will be something we see throughout the textbook and throughout the course as something that was hopefully taught to you um, before this semester, but we can definitely provide resources if that's something that you feel like you really haven't seen to the extent that you want to. Just reach out to us and we can, we can um, give you some really useful um, resources for those. And then the very last column here is the abbreviation for the metric prefix so that we don't have to write it out nearly as longhand. Instead of kilo, we can just write K. Instead of centi, we can just write C. And the most important thing to point out here is there are a lot of M's in physics. Little m is a different abbreviation than capital M, and we don't want to get those two confused. And then micro, which also starts with M, uses the Greek letter mu in order to be slightly different. All right, so a couple of examples to make sure we know how this can be written in a couple of different ways. A kilogram as a phrase can be written out as a thousand grams or in uh, scientific notation 10 to the third grams. One microsecond, tiny fraction of a second, can be written out as 0. 0.000001 seconds or scientific notation 10 to the minus six seconds. And one megameter uh, can be written out as one zero 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 meters, or scientific notation would be 10 to the positive six meters. This works for any unit. So I want you to try this question on your own, the one at the bottom of this slide. If I came up with a unit called a Woolsey, we don't know what it um, measures, but we have this unit, how many Woolseys would be equal to one centiwoolsey. So pause the video and figure that out and commit to an answer, write down an answer in your notes and then unpause when you're ready. Okay, so whenever I ask this question in class, there are always two answers that are most common around the room, either a hundred or one hundredth, 
a fraction. Although we don't need to memorize the prefixes on the previous slide, let's go back to it, we do need to start to build up the understanding of what prefixes refer to fractions of the unit that they describe and which refer to a lot of the unit that we describe. Centi, milli, and micro with those negative exponents for scientific notation mean that we're talking about a small portion of the unit that it's talking about. Kilo, mega, and giga are large amounts of the unit that it's talking about. So when we have one centi Woolsey, that should tell our brains we have a small fraction of a Woolsey. So if you wrote down 100, don't feel that bad about it. We're getting used to these metric prefixes, but you will want to write in your notes that this is going to be something that you want extra practice with because maybe it hasn't been something that has shown up in a lot of your previous classes. Maybe you haven't had enough um, chance to work with these as often, and that's perfectly fine. But it's worth making a note to yourself anytime that you don't quite get things right when we're practicing these during the videos. It just means that that's a quick, easy, no points lost um, reminder that you'll want to think about that a little bit harder. Okay, so it's 100th. 0 0.01 Woolsey's is the answer to this question. Okay, now we're going to use standard international units for every problem in this class when we are doing quantitative problem solving after chapter one, but in everyday life, we don't use that system. We use imperial units. So even if we just think about length units in the US, we have inches and feet and yards and miles, and they're kind of a mess, but we understand them because we use them all the time. And so let's make sure that we know in general how we can convert from one unit type to another. We are going to, in this first video, introduce the idea of what's called the train tracks method. And in the example videos associated with chapter one, we will describe in much more detail and go through it step by step with you several examples that show how this process can work on the smallest examples and the most um, complicated examples of unit conversion. Okay, so part A here. The first thing that we want to do when we have a unit conversion is figure out what we're starting with. What is the number and unit that we have given to us in the problem? In this case, it is two miles. That becomes the start of the conversion that we're going to write out. We also want to identify before we get going what our goal is. It is a lot easier to map out a route if we know our starting point and our ending point. So we know that we want to end with feet, having started with two miles. When we look at the um, things here, 12 inches equals one foot, three feet equals one yard, 5,280 feet equals one mile, those are called unit conversions, conversion factors, rather. These conversion factors you will not have to memorize, but you will have to know to use them and be willing to look them up um, when you're doing homework, and we will provide them on any quiz or test. So the way that the train tracks method works is we start with two miles, and then we attach I'm going to show, this, show us how this works. We attach, with a little crossbar, a conversion factor where we have one part of the conversion factor on top and one on the bottom. So that what we're really doing is multiplying by a factor of one, but able to change the units. Because anytime a unit shows up in equal amounts on the top and the bottom, it will cancel out. I've struck it out in red here. And if a unit does not cancel, it sticks around. We can't just pretend that unit doesn't exist and sweep it under the rug. Feet here only shows up on the top, and so it stays as a final unit. Then with the train tracks method, we multiply everything on top and divide by everything on the bottom. So we have 2 times 5,280 divided by 1 gets us our final answer here. Okay, when we look at this second example, 200 inches is our starting point, yards is our ending point, 
And we need to figure out how to get from point A to point B. When we look at our set of conversion factors, we realize that there's not a single one between inches and yards, okay? This is not the time to go to Google and find that conversion factor that goes straight between inches and yards. The goal is to be able to use the information given to us in a way that helps us understand how units relate to each other. What we do have is inches to feet, and then we have feet to yards. And so our train tracks are a little bit longer. Let's see what that looks like. 200 inches was our starting point. Then we attached a conversion factor. Since inches was on the top already, we need it on the bottom. Then we multiply um, another conversion factor. Since feet was on the top, we need it on the bottom. And yards only shows up on the top, so it sticks around as our final answer, and we end up with 5.6 yards. Really important to point out here, if you do this in your calculator and you do not have parentheses around the bottom part of that fraction, then your calculator will think that you are taking 200, dividing it by 12, but then multiplying that whole thing by 3 you will be off by nearly a factor of 10 if you forget this parentheses. So always, always make sure that you put parentheses. You are smarter than your calculator, and we need to remember that our calculator only does what we tell it to do, and we need to tell it to do the right thing. Okay, so two examples to start out with. One other thing to note is when we use metric prefixes, we tend not to have to use the train tracks method, although we can. But if we recognize that those metric prefixes are basically just a nickname, we can take out the metric prefix and put in what it means. So for example here, 23.7 megameters. 23.7 megameters, we can take the fact that mega means 1 million, or 10 to the 6, and we can replace it. So then 23.7 megameters becomes 23.7 times 10 to the 6 mega uh, 10 to the 6 meters. We've replaced the nickname with the real thing. And while that is fine um, engineering notation and it wouldn't be marked wrong, technically with scientific notation, we want that thing out front to be between 1 and 10. And so we would adjust it. So 2.37 times 10 to the 7 meters is the answer that is following with the notation from our textbook a little bit better. But again, both of those would be okay as final answers. All right. Now, the most common thing that is going to happen in this class is in, you know, five chapters, we'll be talking about something in miles per hour so that we can be thinking about how fast that car is going. But our equations are going to require us to put it into meters per second. By the time that happens, five or six chapters from now, it's going to happen in the next chapter, but by the time that happens, we need to be comfortable with this idea of converting units right away. And so the most common thing that we're going to see is going from imperial units to standard units. So inches to centimeters, feet to meters, miles to kilometers to meters things like that. At the bottom of this list, there's also a note that on Earth, kilograms and pounds can be compared with each other. Although, as I mentioned once before, um, kilograms is a unit of mass, pounds is a unit of weight or force, and we will talk about that distinction in chapter four. All right, so I want you to pause the video and try these two examples using that train tracks method. Again, I am aware that Google can do this almost instantaneously, but then we don't actually understand the meaning of these units and how they relate to each other. So we're trying to practice this process so that we can handle more complex situations that Google won't be able to help us with. So pause the video and try both of these examples in your notes and unpause when you think you have two answers. Okay, let's go through the first one. Five kilometers was our starting point. 
In our list of conversion factors on the slide, the second one down goes from kilometers to miles right away. So we put kilometers on the bottom in the conversion factor because it already showed up on the top so that those will cancel, miles will be left, and we end up with about three miles. So if you run a 5K, you run about three miles. For the second one, how many pounds are in 18 kilograms? 18 kilograms is our starting point, and we know that we're looking for pounds. And conveniently for us, that third step down has a single conversion that gets us to that end goal. They will not all be this easy, but in the same kind of way that when you are trying a new weight machine at the gym, you don't go straight up to the highest number possible. You go easy till you learn how it works, and then you build up your ability from there. We are starting with smaller examples to understand the process so that we can build ourselves up to the full, complete Chapter 1 problems. The train tracks method then that we have started to use but we've really done only small ones so far is the very first thing that happens is you identify what you start with it might even be useful to start writing out in your notes especially if you've already started to struggle and that's perfectly fine this is a new skill for several of us it might be useful to write out we have and then the number and unit that we're starting with then you need to identify what your target unit is. We want to know where our destination is so that we can actually track how to get there. So we want, and then the unit that we're being asked for. Then you take that starting quantity and begin a set of train tracks where each time that you add to it, you are adding a conversion factor. The reason that you choose how to draw that conversion factor, what goes on top and what goes on the bottom, is so that units can cross out if we don't want them. If they appear in equal amounts on the top and bottom, they can go away. And anything that, anything that doesn't go away will be a final unit. And if it's the one that you knew was your target, you can circle it and know that you don't have to do anything to it anymore. You've reached that goal. And then to finish the problem, and in fact, the least important of these five steps is to put it through a calculator to get an actual answer. But the goal, the problem solving goal is really understanding the setup. The actual multiplication is the smallest amount of points in any homework problem. Showing all of those steps is the most important part. So the second video from chapter one, the second lecture video will introduce the way that these unit conversions can get more complex. So that's it for this very first lecture video of the semester. I look forward to working with you and I will see you in that next video.